So I'd like to um, acknowledge the support um, for this study from the Beckley Foundation, um, very generous support um, to get really get us uh, up and going in this uh, line of research, really. Um, this is, I believe, critical work to develop the, just the initial methods and feasibility for really coming up with an approach, so I um, really appreciate their support. So now on to some uh, serious, uh, serious research here. So I'm going to be going over the, as I said, the science component. Um, our study is actually, uh, you probably wouldn't believe me if I said it was sponsored by Philip Morris. Um, it, Beckley Foundation can take credit for the sponsorship. Uh, this is actually a piece of art that our first volunteer gave us. He made it 20 years ago. It's can't see it very well, but it's a cigarette to matches and encased in acrylic, I believe. Um, um, he's an amateur artist. And uh, anyway, he gifted this to the project after he um, successfully quit smoking. Um, just a, a little more background on me. Um, I've been involved with our psilocybin and other psychedelic research for six years since I've been at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm coming in um, with training as, uh, as a behavioral psychologist and, um, and psychopharmacology more broadly, but I really think it's important to view different um, schools of thought as it lenses that can be picked up and used judiciously to look at any, really any problem. And our work on mystical experience and um, occasioned by psilocybin and our work in that general domain of altered states of consciousness, I'm, uh, it's hard to imagine some you know, more interesting work to be involved with in a, you know, an area that's just uh, full of opportunities for, for learning. Um, however, wearing my behavioral scientist cap, I you know, had to step back and say, you know, you know, people report changes in their lives. Even other people in, around them are saying they, they look changed. Um, experiences that are so profound, it kind of calls into question everything. You know, but I think it's you know, important to step back and say, okay, what's really changed? What, you know, how are they, you know, are they making differences in their lives? Um, and I think the best way to look at that, or one of the best ways to look at that, is to look at addiction. Um, people who have been struggling with something for decades and, um, and see if you can, I mean, hey, if you can uh, help someone, if you know anything about them, you don't need to be a scientist to know it's, uh, it's a real challenge to quit smoking and, uh, or to overcome uh, really any uh, drug dependence uh, problem. So that's really how I'm looking at this. It's a real test case of how, how strong this stuff is. So that describes kind of my interest, but I also want to go over um, you know, what sort of background there is to, to, to support using psilocybin to look at smoking cessation. Um, at a very superficial level, why are you using one drug of abuse to treat another drug of abuse? What kind of sense does that make? Is it, um, even, and even folks, though, that are more um, very familiar with, with uh, psychedelic experiences sometimes really don't, um, are kind of perplexed at um, really the goals here and why uh, one would expect this approach to work. So to kind of fill you in on why we think it might work, um, there's really a, a, a good initial body of work from the late 1950s to the early 70s um, using um, classical hallucinogens um, uh, in the treatment of alcoholism and other forms of substance dependence. There's uh, some work on opioid or heroin addiction. But most of it was, uh, it was primarily using LSD as the hallucinogen or psychedelic um, in the treatment of alcoholism. And while, while some studies prepared patients and utilized supportive conditions, um, others administered high doses to unprepared, physically restrained patients. So I think this really highlights that um, what we're looking at, I don't think it's an overuse of the, of the term a, pa a paradigm change. It's really a different paradigm, different treatment modality. Um, the, some of the folks that picked up on this work, the, the last study I have referenced, you know, say, well, LSD can cure it. Alcoholism, let's just kind of you know, take, the, you know, take two pills and call me in the morning approach and see if that works. Um, really worse than that, um, restrained in a hospital bed, said we're going to give you an experimental drug, no indication that you're going to feel differently. 
Um, and so, and a dose of 800 micrograms, probably a little high, especially with zero preparation. Um, so that didn't work. So <laughs> looking across the literature, there have been a number of, of excellent reviews, and one would have to conclude that um, you know, results were ultimately inconclusive due to such variations in methods and a lack of experimental rigor. And that's something we want to keep in mind moving forward. Uh, interestingly, mystical type experiences may have mediated successful clinical response. There's some support for that. Despite suggested preliminary findings, follow up with rigorous studies using high levels of patient preparation and interpersonal support, um, which we believe are key, were never conducted. So it's a, um, there wasn't a whole lot of work that really combined rigorous experimental um, design and a really great clinical approach. Um, there was some. Human research with hallucinogens in the U.S. unfortunately became dormant soon after much of the initial research on hallucinogen-facilitated treatment of substance dependence was published. And importantly, that dormancy was not due to scientific or medical concerns, really, but in reaction to the drug excesses of the 60s, the whole um, counterculture issue, and, and, and the reckless behavior of an uh, a very small number of clinical investigators doing um, hallucinogen uh, research. Although some of those investigators also conducted and contributed um, important work scientifically. There's also a whole domain in the uh, area of anthropology that's suggestive of efficacy. So reports suggest that hallucinogen use within the ritualized practices of indigenous cultures may potentially be efficacious in the treatment of a variety of forms of drug dependence with reported high rates of recovery and prolonged abstinence. So there's evidence from um, peyote use within the Native American church, ayahuasca use in Amazonian societies and in uh, syncretic religions. Um, however, it's important to step back and say, well, this is correlational. There's also research suggesting involvement in, in religious or spiritual activities is associated with low rates of um, substance abuse and dependence. So you have to step back and say, well, it's not entirely you know, clear whether it's the larger role of religious and spiritual support. There's also evidence from similar uh, drug classes. Um, ketamine is an NMDA antagonist used extensively in anesthesia. Um, however, it's described as hallucinogen-like at sub-anesthetic doses and report it um, to sometimes occasion mystical type uh, experiences. And it's interesting to note that classical um, serotonin 5-HT2A as LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, etc. Um, hallucinogens and NMDA antagonists like ketamine share um, a common final glutamatergic pathway accounting for similarities in uh, the resulting experiences. And it, several published studies show that a single or small number of sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine um, uh, promote abstinence in both alcohol and heroin dependence. And this research has um, done a nice job showing, a, uh, this is done by um, Kropitsky in Russia, um, that absent rates significant, were significantly higher for those receiving uh, ketamine than in control groups for up to one to two years, and have shown a relationship between the mystical nature of the experience and treatment efficacy. Um, again, encouraging us that this kind of mystical dimension that we've been studying more of a basic science sense can really be critical to the clinical applications we're looking at. There's also there's also um, evidence um, from our lab and others on uh, using psilocybin in non-dependent volunteers. So to go over our work, um, Griffiths et al. Uh, in 2006 uh, found that psilocybin administration occasioned mystical type experience using um, validated uh, questionnaires. Um, and tightly controlled experimental design. For 14 months after the original study, the majority of participants considered the experience to be among the five most personally meaningful or spiritually significant experiences of their lives. Ratings by community observers blinded to drug condition. So, you know, just like the uh, volunteer doesn't know which drug to get on any particular day, that's true certainly of the other, their friends and family members that were um, working with to collect data from. Um, in, 
those data from those community observers, um, friends and family members, coworkers, and two months after each session indicated that compared to methylphenidate, or Ritalin, high dose of Ritalin, which is an active comparator drug in that study, psilocybin was associated with significant increases in positive mood and behavior. I just want to emphasize the behavior. This is what other people in the community are noticing about the folks who had uh, gone through our program. At 14 months uh, follow-up, 61% of participants rated the experience was associated with moderate to extreme positive behavior change. Greater ratings of mystical experience after session, but not pure drug effect intensity or drug straight, strength, predicted greater levels of reported personal and spiritual meaning at 14 months. Again, highlighting this uh, potential role of this, the mystical realm. It's not just administering a certain chemical to somebody, but it's the type of experience that might be occasioned by that. And so this is suggestive of um, potential behavioral efficacy for drug dependence with po a possible role for the mystical type experience. So we cooked up a feasibility study um, it's a small end study with the goal to develop the approach and demonstrate feasibility, not to test efficacy. So I'm not going to be able to present to you data today, you know, conclusively showing that um, psilocybin is responsible for any efficacy because it would really take a different design. This, this is an earlier stage than that to kind of demonstrate efficacy and to work out procedures. Cigarette smoking was selected as a model system of drug dependence um, for a couple important reasons. Uh, uh, the relative lack of social and economic impairment that often accompanies other forms of drug dependency, so opioids, like heroin, um, cocaine, and, and alcoholism, can all, can all be associated with some really severe impairment, socioeconomic, and other life uh, real obstacles that you have to be up against. So if you're interested in kind of really going after the heart of addiction, we were thinking cigarette smokers is a good um, uh, population. And also there are, even though they're not widely highlighted, there are anecdotal reports of quitting after psilocybin LSD. A number of people have contacted us with anecdotal stories. There's Arrowhead reports on, on this. Um, there's some uh, written accounts and books um, by folks in the psychedelic research world from the older era of research. So the approach we took was to integrate cognitive behavior therapy and guided imagery exercises for psilocybin, uh, for smoking cessation. Um, so approaches that have been used in the treatment of um, cigarette smoking to help people quit smoking. With our laboratory's previous approach to psilocybin session preparation and follow-up, I think this is an important point. We, we're not screwing with what we do well. We're incorporating that and building around it. Um, I think it's also important to point some people say, oh, is that which Hopkins study? Is that the mystical experience study or is that your cancer study or your... We're looking at the mystical experience at, at the heart of everything we do. And we think that's a, a, you know, a part of the treatment efficacy. So they're all mystical experience studies. We use multiple sessions, up to three psilocybin sessions, ranging from the target quit date uh, to up to eight weeks after um, the target quit date. So the dose is we started the first session uh, at 20 milligrams for 70 kilograms. That was concurrent with the, with the target quit date to quit smoking. And the second and third sessions were 30 milligrams for 70 kilograms. To give you some um, rough metric of this, um, 30 milligrams per 70 kgs was the what we used in our, um, our originally published study in 2006 that, that Roland published. And um, there's variation, uh, but, but based on the average potency of street samples of um, uh, psilocybin cubensis, which is the most common form of psilocybin mushroom in the illicit market, it's the equivalent of somewhere in between an eighth ounce and a quarter ounce of mushroom. So this is a, this is a high dose. Um, so you can kind of judge the 20 based on that. And I should uh, actually just back up and say that the point of um, uh, the the point of starting uh, in giving multiple sessions. There's a couple reasons for that. Older, uh, the, there's several older uh, studies that I reviewed earlier that did show initial efficacy, and you'd see. And these were group designs where they, you know, have some people have the experimental treatment, and there's some type of control. Um, condition that other people would get. And, and the people receiving LSD would look uh, like they're really doing better, less drug use, 
one, two, maybe three months out, and then you see the curves come together. And there were a number of these papers which suggested, yeah, there's this thing kind of what we're called the afterglow. People see me different for a while, but there can be a fading of that. So we really need to look at a multiple um, dosing paradigm. And this would also be suggested by the evidence I, I um, discussed concerning the indigenous cultures. It's not like, oh, you've had your one peyote session, you're good for the rest of your life. Um, so uh, we kind of wanted to extend it out throughout, you know, you know, it's, you know, we looked at the relapse curves for smoking and really brought it out to the point where we thought that uh, uh, we kind of got past a major risk um, uh, time point in the curve. So we put ads in local, in paper, local papers seeking, uh, seeking smokers wanting to quit. Um, the advertisements did emphasize the entheogenic effects of psilocybin, sort of the mystical or spiritual type of effects and their use in indigenous cultures for those reasons. Daily smokers with multiple um, previous quit attempts um, are the target. They're healthy as determined by interview, medical questionnaire, physical exam, ECG, other routine blood medical, urinalysis laboratory tests. Um, Safety procedures were used, including um, inclusion and exclusion criteria, as suggested by guidelines that we published a couple of years ago for high dose research with um, classical hallucinogens. The outcome measures related to smoking are, first of all, our two bio biological measures um, breath carbon monoxide. A carbon monoxide is a product from uh, burning the tobacco, it's the major uh, toxin associated with the cardiac toxicity and deaths associated with smoking. It has a relatively short time course, it clears out of the system um, relatively quickly in less than a day. Um, we also looked at urine cotinine, cotinine is a major metabolite of nicotine, it has a much longer half-life, you can pick up um, recent smoking uh, on a longer time course, uh, closer to like a week. And then we use uh, va validated, sort of widely used questionnaires that are kind of just used to get people's retrospe retrospective assessment of how much they've smoked recently on every day. We looked at a withdrawal scale using a standard uh, and widely accepted questionnaire on smoking urges. By, um, we're looking at also at a number of um, me measures that might get at the potential and it's psychological mechanisms or mediators of efficacy. So first of all, this, the mystical experience, as I mentioned, but also measures of self-efficacy, self-awareness, mindfulness, reprioritization of life values, and changes in time perspective, all domains that we think um, are involved with, and there's research uh, showing that are involved with addiction or that we think might uh, come about from a, a, a well-done psilocybin session that might affect a, addiction. Study timeline description. There were two screening visits for the extensive um, screening. Four preparatory, preparatory visits, um, up to two hours each, with the treatment team. The treatment team consisted of Mary Casimano and myself. We wanted to really be involved with all of the sessions to get a really uh, good feel for what's going on clinically. Um, so we, the two folks, Mary and I, all served as both the. Um, had prep sessions with the individual in addition were the actual um, drug session uh, uh, study monitors. So we assigned a target quit date during the preparation sessions and we went over cognitive behavioral therapy techniques and we started having them do things that part of cognitive behavioral therapy for smoking cessation. So keeping a smoking diary, identification of cues and consequences of smoking, techniques to break the automaticity of smoking, relapse prevention techniques for dealing with potential lapses, um, acceptance of potential weight gain. We have guided imagery exercises designed to increase autom autonomy and self-efficacy, which have previously been used um, recently as part of an efficacious group therapy-based um, smoking cessation program that we are impressed by, so we incorporate aspects of that. It includes, uh, dis as, we do, as with all of our psilocybin sessions, our preparation included discussion of life history, family, relationships, philosophical, spiritual orientation, and in addition here, smoking history, very importantly and the specific preparation for psilocybin session day and psilocybin effects, how to deal with the effects, what they might expect. Um, the target quit date, as I mentioned, was concurrent with the first psilocybin session, the lower of the two doses, although it's a pretty hefty dose. 
Um, and the day after, we had a discussion with the participants, as we always do, to integrate, help them talk through the, about their experience, what it might mean for them. Within two weeks after the target quit date, um, there is an additional one to a uh, two-hour meeting with the treatment team to discuss psilocybin session, continue with the CBD techniques, guided imagery, and to collect outcome measures. Two weeks after the target quit date um, was the second psilocybin session, the higher dose, and then we had day after discussion, like I said before. And continually through weeks three to seven after the target quit date, the volunteers came in weekly one at, for one hour meetings with the treatment team for CBT and guided imagery outcome measures. At eight weeks after the target quit date, they would have a third session same sort of pattern we meet with them the day after. Weeks 9 through 10, we continue to, to follow them. Um, uh, they have two additional weekly meetings um, to continue with the techniques. And, and then they're done with the active phase, and we simply have them, have them come in for a six-month and 12-month follow-up for all of the outcome measures. And again, every time I mention outcome measures, it includes, importantly, biological verification of whether they've been smoking in addition to what they've been telling us. So I'm going to actually skip by this, um, let Mary um, discuss this, but two participants have been treated, um, have really gone through the active phase of treatment. Um, one's at about 12 uh, months out, one's at about six months out, and they've both quit smoking, and they're doing great. Um, we have a third subject which will do, who's also quit smoking, and it's been about two months, and she's doing great, although it's very recent, we don't have the, I'm showing the data, but I'll show you some data on um, those first two subjects. So self-reports indicate both participants quit smoking on target quit date, concurrent with the first psilocybin session. Uh, the one subject uh, has lapsed on three occasions having a single cigarette, um, all three times when she was drinking. Um, although none of these lapses led to a full relapse, so she, I think, I think utilized the part of the cognitive behavior therapy that we went over in terms of how to deal with a lapse. And otherwise, no reported smoking by either participant. Self-report, um, self um, uh, measures are supported by both biological assays of smoking. So here you can go to the C CO, that point where it plummets is the day after the first session. So this is a, they can't fool us with this stuff. And, um, and with the cotinine measure. Again, the plummet is concurrent with our first session. So it's not all talk, it's not all talk people. This is real, real change. Both participants attribute aspects of the psilocybin session experience as contributing to smoking cessation success. Mary will talk more about that. Um, there was mystical type aspects of the experience for both. In conclusion, I'd like to say that the low in and lack of control group and placebo or placebo conditions certainly preclude conclusions regarding the efficacy of psilocybin per se. I wouldn't want someone coming out of here, oh, I saw someone from Johns Hopkins saying they, you know, psilocybin works to, to cure cigarette smoking. We're not there yet. Re results could be um, fully and unquestionably uh, partially driven by expectation, the CBT techniques, guided imagery, and or the relatively high level of psychosocial um, support. I think talking to Mary uh, an hour once a week would probably help uh, quite a few people quit by itself. So we need more work to tease that out. The approach is feasible, and subjective reports attribute a substantial but not independent role um, to psilocybin. Um, so they made claims, but uh, about experiences le contributing to their success. Um, but it, they also claimed it to be high; those experiences to be highly interactive with the full treatment approach and the support they received from the treatment team. And, and importantly, we're, we're developing and we're working from a, a, a draft manual based on this inter intervention, which will serve to support a future controlled trial testing the specific role of psilocybin, which would be warranted if we continue to get promising results. So with that, I need to wrap up and um, actually hand it off to my tag team partner, Mary, who will describe some real, probably more interesting um, in-depth case descriptions um, from our volunteers. So if you join me in welcoming Mary Casamano. Thank you, Matt. Um, you put together a fantastic program. I'm really um, honored to be an integral part of it. Um, first, I just want to again thank everyone here. Um, thank Neil, Kevin, all the groups that um, have helped put this together. I wish that I could just stand here and tell you about the two volunteers that um, I'm going to present and really you know, be able to talk and go into more detail and get more of a um, personal kind of um, outline of them. 
but in the interest of time and wanting it to flow so you can really hear their experience, um, I'm going to read it. It had nothing to do with me being nervous. Um, Mary Casamano, as Neil and Matt said, and I have been with Johns Hopkins States of Consciousness Research Team for the past 10 years, involved extensively in all of the five psilocybin studies. First two studies are completed. Both were with healthy normals, examining the basic effects of psilocybin, including spiritual experiences. We're currently running three psilocybin studies, one administering psilocybin to treat cancer patients who are experiencing anxiety or depression as a result of their diagnosis. Another is to examine the effects of psilocybin sessions while incorporating specific spiritual practices into their daily lives. And the third, of course, is our smoking study. I'm really excited about this study. I believe that the potential therapeutic value is significant, and the program that Matt and Roland put together is impressive. And again, I'm very honored to be an integral part of it. Today, I'd like to present two of our subjects in the smoking study. And as Matt said, um, one is almost at his one year date and has quit, and the other just had her six month follow up. Um, so, to begin, um, Matt pointed out in his presentations that there's different components that we use along with the psilocybin sessions. Um, one of those key components is the use of a mantra. To assist the volunteer in finding their unique mantra, we have them list all the reasons that they want to quit smoking and what it means to them to be a non-smoker. And then from that list, we go over all the reasons and um, have to use my glasses. I'm just starting to have to use them, so I'm not quite used to them. What it means for them to be a non-smoker, and then we work with them from that list to find their particular mantra. And this is a statement that really gets to the core of what it means to them to be a non-smoker. And when they repeat this um, statement, it kind of symbolizes the reasons they want to quit, and repeating it over and over again, it slowly becomes imprinted in their being. Our first volunteer was Chuck, and comfortable and cozy is kind of his um, description of his um, experience. Chuck was a 59-year-old male and professional artist. He smoked close to 20 cigarettes a day for the past 41 years, interspersed with multiple quit attempts, ranging from a day to six years, but most attempts lasted only about two weeks. Like most smokers, Chuck had many reasons he wanted to quit smoking. Among Chuck's reasons to quit, to have more energy, more money, more oxygen to his body, sleep better, procrastinate less, and therefore be more productive in his work. He also knew he would eat better and have more of an appetite. He was often, he would tell us he would often um, smoke rather than eat, and he had to keep up his weight because he was really a very slender man. But the bottom line for Chuck was that he wanted to be healthier. He'd been healthy all his life, able to do just about anything he wanted to do. He was now turning 60 years old, and although he could still do most things, he was beginning to experience, as he put it, arthritic pain, old age pain and a decrease in his energy, and he did not like it. He talked about how he had been a bit of a rebel, especially when he lived in New York City in the 60s. He believed he still had some of that in him, and he knew he associated his cigarette smoking with being a rebel. It was very much associated with that period of time in his life, so it held a very special meaning to him. In talking more about the association of being a non-smoker, um, of the smoke, I'm sorry, of his smoking as being a way of a rebel, he said that deep down he knew that this was just a rationalization, an absurd way to show control. Chuck really talked, he really liked to talk, and he had a very philosophical bent to him. So when we explored his mantra, we talked a lot about what it meant to be Chuck. Who am I? What do I want? After many attempts, he put into a single sentence his mantra, I am comfortable and I am confident and content and free to be who I am. 
After listing all the reasons the volunteer wants to quit and then finding their mantra, then we explore the reasons that they want to continue smoking. Some of Chuck's reasons were that it was great with coffee, helped him to get away from it all, and helped him to focus. The social aspects were also important, and as he put it, it was a way of really bonding with others, a communion with others. After listing all the reasons they want to continue smoking, together we go over each of those reasons and we have them explore how they believe that continuing smoking will achieve that. And then the final step is to refute each of those reasons. So we have them again go over each reason and then see how it um, really doesn't um, achieve that. Chuck said his first session was a wonderful experience. He felt loved and humbled without doing anything just being. He said he w it was amazing and valuable. He said the session directly connected him to his mantra, I am confident and content and free to be who I am. In his session report the next day, he wrote, this is like being present where anything feels possible. I am comfortable to wait and see. I want to share this feeling of being held here coddled and cozy, just simply being is so unique. It holds me without effort. I am so grateful to be here. A week after the session, Chuck said as he was writing in his smoking diary, he noticed the triggers and they were strongest when he was in his shop working. But he realized he can and is working longer and with better continuity without taking a smoking break. He noticed time was different because there was nothing to give him barriers, so he was more productive. He did say he felt a sense of loss of camaraderie because he often took breaks with apartment neighbors throughout the day, but he was learning to accept this. Ten days after his quit date, he said the biggest surprise was how influential the scented oil had been to him, a very valuable tool. We can talk about that later, how we use the scented oil as part of our program. He often sniffed the oil because it invoked a powerful association with the entire program and most prominently with a therapeutic relationship with Matt and I. The resulting effect was that it reinforced his being a non-smoker. Two weeks later, he had a second session, and he said it was one of exultation, fun, joy, and it was childlike. I was taken care of so that I was able to expand and see with new eyes. He said, I was made comfortable and cozy, safe and secure. This session, he felt strongly tied with the guided imagery component of the study. As Matt pointed out, we use guided imagery exercises to increase independence and self-confidence. We end every session and preparation and integration meeting with a guided imagery and always begin with the instructions to fully immerse yourself in the experience with childlike abandon and joy. And this is followed by the statement, I am comfortable and cozy. And Chuck loved that and he reported that he felt this session related to those guided imagery experiences. As with his first session, he believed this gave him the confidence and security to continue to be a non-smoker. He said the tools of the study are becoming part of his life. Six weeks later, he had his third session. He said it was similar to his first, his first two, and in an interesting way tied them together. He said he felt comfortable and cozy physically, confident and content mentally. To have both together is a sense of the eternal. In his follow-up session, Chuck still considers himself a non-smoker and registered a zero on the cotinine and carbon monoxide. With one month left until his one-year follow-up date, Chuck is still a non-smoker, more than ever feels confident that he will be. He shared with us that during one of his sessions, psilocybin sessions, a question came up for him. Who am I going to be in the next 30 to 40 years? Before, it always tied with being determined to be a non-smoker. But now that he was a non-smoker, he said there were so many other possibilities. Our second volunteer is Barbara, and hers um, is not just one. Barbara was our second volunteer, couldn't have been more different. She was a 26-year-old female, a teacher by profession, been smoking since she was 12, by the time she was 18, had been smoking close to a pack a day. Had tried numerous times to quit, the most successful being about two months, 
and that was two years before she entered our study. One of her quit attempts was using Alan Carr's CBT program. Other quit attempts included medication Zyban, which she tried twice but only lasted a few weeks, and numerous times tried using her willpower, but those only lasted three days to a week. As I said earlier with Chuck, most, most smokers have a reason they want to quit. Barbara was not an exception. I'm going faster so I can get it all done. Among her reasons were to be uh, um, more productive, to be healthier, relieve stress, have more money, be more productive at work, smell better, better, have one less thing to carry around. There were a few reasons that were most important to her. One of those was because she always kept cigarettes a secret from her family and they would be very upset if they knew because they, especially her mother, would worry about her. This caused a barrier in her otherwise very close family relationship and understandably it was unsettling. She felt that her smoking kept her from being as, as effective as, and productive as possible in her work as a teacher because during the day she found that she was often thinking about craving a cigarette and thinking about when she um, could go out and have a cigarette break. Another real concern was the fact that she couldn't control her smoking most areas of her life she could control, and this really bothered her. But again, with her, the most important reason was her health. In thinking about a mantra that will incorporate these, Barbara remembered when she was a young girl growing up and had an image of riding her bike and feeling carefree and very alive. From that image came her mantra, I am living my life as I did when I was young, with insouciance, freedom, and joy. For those of you who, like me, were unsure of the meaning, insouciance means carefree. In exploring Barbara's reasons to continue smoking, she said she loved smoking while driving, ending a meal with a cigarette, making it more satisfying. She said it wakes her up in the morning, winds her down in the evening. And like Chuck, Barbara also enjoyed smoking socially, and at social gatherings she enjoyed slipping outside and having a smoke together with her friends. Um, smoking represented many pleasures. She actually said that the biggest factor to continue smoking was that it was a reliable satisfaction. About midway into her first session, she had a very powerful image of herself relating to smoking. She said, I remember myself first thinking that sm focusing on smoking wasn't even important because I hadn't even thought about it since I started feeling the effects of psilocybin so I must not need to smoke. And then I saw an image of my lighting a cigarette and saw that Im image duplicated many times over and tried to count all the cigarettes I've had in my lifetime. I tried to remember specific ones, but mostly I just kept coming back to the one image duplicated over, duplicated, and saw that there's no such thing as just one. One cigarette is never enough. A thousand is never enough. One and a thousand are the same. Having one cigarette is the same as a thousand. The message she took from this image was that she cannot be a sm social smoker and cannot have just one. This was huge for her because she really thought that it was possible, or at least she held out the hope that it was. She talked a lot with Matt and I in our preparatory sessions about how she knew other friends and acquaintances could do this, and she really wanted it to be true for her. But um, once she had this image, she realized that she could not smoke just one. Following weeks weren't easy for her, but um, I'm going to skip some of this. She um, was able to get through it. Two weeks later, she had her second session. It was a mix of confusion, disintegration, bliss, and sadness. In her follow-up report, Barbara said, sometime while I was feeling sad, I got an intense craving for a cigarette. I knew then that I just wanted one because I was feeling lonely and I thought about myself sitting in my apartment crying and chain smoking. I wanted to give up and go home and do just that. Just sit in my living room and smoke cigarette after cigarette. I started to make concrete plans on how I would smoke when the session was over. My boyfriend would pick me up and we would go out to dinner. When we came home, I would insist on taking a walk by myself and walk to the 7-Eleven and then just walk around smoking cigarette after cigarette and crying. After I got up and laid down again, the craving was still there but started to dissipate. Despite having this very powerful craving and plan as part of her psilocybin experience, she did not smoke after the session. But another memory from that session was a feeling of bliss. It was only momentary, but it was very powerful and meaningful. She had never had that experience before. 
and in her session report she said the session helped me to remain quit by helping me understand that my true self is and always has been a non-smoker she said she wanted to start a new behavior to associate with being a non-smoker so she took up running a month after her second session she said she still remembers that feeling of bliss and not being connected to anything in particular but just being aware she said the session was significant and that it motivated her to just about done Neil to nurture her spiritual life she also said she could use this session as an, session as an anchor when trying to relax needless to say she had a lot of awareness and introspection and she said that she now feels like a non-smoker although the program calls for up to three sessions after much contemplation Barbara decided not to have a third session she felt she was well on her way to success and thought of herself as a non-smoker at her six-month follow-up Barbara registered a zero on cotinine and carbon monoxide as Matt said she did have one cigarette on three separate occasions while drinking with friends she did say it was different this time that she felt conflicted while having the cigarette <clears throat> and she didn't truly enjoy it <clears throat> she still considers herself a non-smoker and does not plan on continuing to have the occasional cigarette because she still believes she cannot have just one one more minute I think it's important to note the fact that Barbara chose not to have a third psilocybin session I think this is a nice demonstration of the fact that psilocybin is not a drug of addiction meaning that with psilocybin people do not face the craving and loss of control like they often do with cigarettes this is not to say that it cannot be abused if used in a reckless and unsafe manner and so to conclude but somehow my final didn't get on there but in conclusion although it is obvious it is much too early to make any definitive conclusions as of this time we do have three out of our three subjects that have continued smoking I forgot to just the third um, volunteer that Matt said is in the middle of the study has had two sessions is two months in has quit smoking but we're not going into detail over her today but she has quit so we have three out of three at this point Thank you. Oh. Matt, so that was wonderful and our acknowledgments Matt Kleindens, who is fantastic and has just done an amazing amount of work in all those areas and more for us, and Dr. Annie Umbridge, and um, gosh, there's so many other people, but Matt, come on up. Come on up, Matt. Feel and some Matt, questions. Because he put together this amazing program. Yeah, this gentleman. Authorship slide, most, most certainly Roland Griffiths. And Roland, of who's a, Yeah, really. He's just absolutely critical always, part of this. <laughs> always there. So we have a question over here. Sir. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Phil. Um, <clears throat> smoke is cough. It's very relevant. Um, I just want to say it's a really great study, and I think it's looking out for the benefit of humanity, so I think it's great. And uh, I think in an existential sense, is it possible that the psilocybin experience could be seen as a peak experience, and after experiencing it without smoking, you kind of build your habits to a point where you don't need it anymore. It's almost as if addiction is a crutch, and the psilocybin experience is like opening a light outside of addiction. Could this be true? It sounds like a good description to me. I mean, I think one of the wonderful things is there are so many, I mean, I think of Torsten's talk where, you know, people are going into the depths of their psyche, if you want to call it that, and there's a the descriptors are endless for, you know, it doesn't always map on to logical and rational things we can say about, you know, what this is, how this works. And so all of these, you know, experiences are, the descriptors are unique. They're kind of going deep into the well and pulling out something. And what we're hearing is, you know, oftentimes very different ways of saying what I suspect are experiences with a common core. But I would see kind of your description is in line with that. Another question back here. Thanks. That's a really uh, nice to see a good scientific look at this stuff. Um, as researchers out in the field, um, what changes do you see happening in the field overall using hallucinogenics as therapy and researchers going out on a limb to do that and the feds, you know, coughing up money for it or whoever? Not sure what you said. I, didn't um, I think hear it. To, to just uh, reiterate if this is what you were asking, just the potential future clinical use 
substances and whether that's likely and how that's going to look. I mean, um, and Mary, feel, feel free to add, but, uh, you know, certainly these are, you know, these are Schedule One substances, so it's an uphill battle, you know, if the, you know, the, the if, you know, studies continue to demonstrate safety and efficacy for a particular indication, like smoking cessation, because that's the way the FDA works, um, you know, it's possible that there would, you know, it would actually still psilocybin would have to be rescheduled because um, even if it were scheduled to like cocaine you could have a therapeutic application FDA approved therapeutic application so it's an uphill battle but um, you know certainly it's uh, possible I think important in the work we do now is emphasize if these things are do have a broader therapeutic application in our society it's not the you know take two and call me in the morning approach I think it's a, you know, it's a para with the, with the possible exception of the um, the research on um, or the likely exception of the research on cluster headaches, where it appears to be more of a physiological you know uh, effect. Whereas the research we're interested in is uh, in our work is you know, psychologically mediated. It's about the experience, not about the molecule. I've seen a, a big change in the 10 years um, ago that we started, and really for the first five years, we did not, because of the way that society could um, latch onto it and show it negatively, we really stayed out of any media. And um, when we first got published then in 2006, and then the continual studies we've had since then and the other ones going on um, around the country, there has been such a major shift in the media, as they were talking about earlier. So from five, for the first five years, nothing to these last next five years, it's everywhere, um, you know, little by little. So we're really hoping that that's just going to continue to increase exponentially. Other questions? Question here. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that so far you've only had you know three subjects and you haven't had a control group. Uh, do you have anything in the works that's going to be able to help you say whether or not the psilocybin was actually a major catalyst or just a minor contributing factor by the time you're done with this? Will you be able to be more conclusive about it? Absolutely. So the the uh, yeah the whole point of this is to prepare to set the groundwork for a controlled clinical trial. You need a lot of money to do that. So that's it. But. But with the uh, but with the pilot data and the feasibility shown, it's easier to get that money. Yes, we hope that if we get the um, you know 100 percent or even close, which is huge, that that will give us you know the um, availability then to go to a and, large study. And and importantly, in terms, although it's very weak comparison across studies, I want to say that, but. The, the rates of, smo of success in smoking cessation, as well as addiction treatment in general, are so low. I mean, we'd expect you know, rates between you know, uh, yeah, 10, 20, 30 percent would be really, really like phenomenal. Like 40, a study published, I think we borrowed the guided imagery exercises from, got a success rate of 40 percent continuous absence up to a year. That's kind of off the charts. So if we can show in our kind of approach, to, yeah, if we can get most of our subjects to quit, I think it looks feasible and promising. Sir? As far as your exclusion criteria, how did that include people? Did you exclude people with prior drug experience? And particularly, did these people have any prior psychedelic experience in the study? Go ahead. Um, so uh, both of the subjects, uh, yeah, we present ha did have prior um, psychedelic experience. Um, our first subject, Chuck, had an, an LSD experience back in uh, in the I think this was this was the 1960s, late 60s, I believe in a field in Florida, which is one of the most profound kind of uh, transcendental experience that's ever been described to me. So I think, I mean, this guy's a philosopher at heart, but he hadn't used these things in years and years, decades. Neither. Neither. We wouldn't take them if they had, well, we're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we want people that aren't, uh, you know, for this right. you know, particular approach that, you know, if, if we give them psilocybin and, they're, and they stop smoking, it doesn't mean much if they took psilocybin last week and a month ago and you know so both right. of our and our, our second one had a previous experience with psilocybin right and but nothing more a party lot, kind many of many years ago like 20 to 30 years ago and the second subject mm -hmm. she's oh, only oh, 26 sorry. I was thinking about <laughs> she third. didn't use it when she was six years no. old <laughs> the second subject wasn't 20 years ago but I was she, thinking it was about third volunteer oh, okay yeah she uh yeah. anyway it was more of a college kind of party nothing 
pretty... Nothing profound. Yeah, yeah, imagery type stuff. Other questions? Sir. Hi, was there an effort to shield the participants from the reality that them quitting smoking would legitimize psychedelics for the world? Would that be a motivating factor for them to quit? That is if a, they've had a psilocybin experience. That's, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, yeah. Are they quitting smoking because you know, they, they like us and they want to be supportive? Of, and if, it, if they quit smoking, our results look great and it's great for this. Obviously, they volunteered into the study, so at least they're open to the area of psychedelic research. So, you know, that's a great question. That could be dry. I would say if that's part of the results, I mean, it's a very interactive thing because part of their deep kind of, you know, kind of trust in us is a part of the preparation and the experience in the session of going through. So it's very interactive. So questions like that would be nicely addressed with a controlled, you know, group randomized trial where that would be a place with everybody. So, yeah, it's a very good point, very good point. We have run out of time. So I'd like to ask everyone to help me thank Matt and Mary.